York City, I uh, met up with uh, Gabriel Shipton. And um, Gabriel Shipton was um, in town. He's going to be around for tomorrow because there is a big demonstration outside the consulate, a UK British consulate on 47th and 2nd Avenue. Uh, that's a surprise to some of the people who are watching. This whole show today was really done on the seat of our pants. Uh, so it's it, it, this is a Progressive Radio Network as we speak. Uh, and I'm Randy Credico. And um, we have Kelly Lane joining us from, uh, not joining us, but she's engineering. We slapped this thing together a few hours ago because of the, when I ran across Gabriel yesterday, uh, I had been, I received two uh, simultaneous uh, text messages, one from Sebim, uh, the, the uh, German uh, legislator, and one from Angela, who was on our show uh, a, week, a week and a half ago. And uh, they had sent me a link to this Daily Mail article where Julian Assange uh, had suffered a stroke, something that our, will be no surprise to our special guest, uh, Niels Melzer. We'll get to him in just one second. Uh, so, you know, I spoke to Gabriel. I just met him in the subway. We were stuck in the subway for half an hour. I went to my friend Steve's house for dinner. And uh, of course he was uh, very concerned about it. Uh, this had happened, had happened uh, way back, not way back, but in October. Uh, but uh, this, as I said, came as no surprise to our first, I may as well get right into it. I am Randy Credico. This is Randy Credico, special edition uh, of Assange Countdown to Freedom on the Progressive Radio Network here at 10 a.m. in the morning in uh, New York City on Monday. Today, Monday at noon, uh, there is a rally at the British concert. I mentioned it. We're going to have one of the organizers in on the uh, other hour that we're going to do special uh, and talk about it. Uh, and Katie Halper later on. Gabriel's going to join us midway through this show. Uh, and uh, let me just get right into uh, giving the details of, of that event tomorrow, which we all talked about the other day with Roger and John Pilger, the need for direct action. And uh, welcome back on such quick notice, uh, Dr. Melzer. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, you were on, you've been talking about this. You've done so much on uh, what the uh, prison conditions, the legal quagmire, the the unflagging uh, persecution on, uh, on so many levels and from so many different angles. I, I, I guess you weren't surprised by this. Uh, it comes as no surprise. You kind of like, you didn't want it to happen, but it's not a surprise to you that this would happen, this stroke that uh, Mr. Assange suffered. No, it didn't come as a surprise. Obviously, it's always tragic when events materialize like this. But you see, I visited Julian Assange two and a half years ago uh, when he first was arrested by the British authorities after almost seven years in increasingly oppressive um, circumstances at the embassy of Ecuador in London. At the time, he already showed all the symptoms that are typical for a victim of psychological torture. And I have said this all along, and uh, people keep underestimating what that actually means. Uh, psychological torture is not torture light. It is a clandestine form of torture where through isolation, uh, arbitrariness, uh, uh, threat, uh, destabilization, uh, disorientation, and basically attrition. Uh, people are being destroyed. Their identity is being destroyed. Their mental resilience is being destroyed. And it ends up at the end, having physical consequences. At the time already, we could measure physical uh, damage, neurological damage, cognitive harm that had been caused by extreme levels of relentless stress and anxiety that cannot, is not comparable to what any prisoner would go through. Uh, it really uh, eats at the nervous system. And it, it, it can, it's difficult to predict exactly how this plays out, you know, over a period of months and years, but uh, always, uh, almost inevitably, it will end up having physical consequences and it can endanger life. So strokes, 
It could be a cardiac arrest. It could be a nervous breakdown. Um, but very serious consequences almost inevitably results at the end of the lane. What? I mean, he was in the embassy. That in and of itself, not knowing your fate, causes psychological stress and anxiety. Uh, going from the frying pan into the fire, the, uh, the prison at Belmarsh, did that uh, intensify? Uh, the, the stress and anxiety, uh, the psychological torture? Well, it, you see, what's really important to understand that in psychological torture, it's a mental, emotional process. So the, the most uh, important element of this is the threat scenario, that someone is under constant threat, that he feels that he is uh, constantly in danger. And that feeling clearly increased exponentially once he had to leave the embassy, which, which used to be you know, his, his place of asylum, his basically the refuge from the threat scenario that he was most uh, afraid of, the extradition to the United States. And lo and behold, uh, you know, in the first hour when he, had, you know, he was expelled from the embassy, the, the, the United States actually transmitted its extradition request to the United Kingdom. So he had been long, uh, right all along that he uh, uh, you know, sought for uh, asylum at, at the embassy. And so clearly that threat scenario became much more real and concrete once he was in the hands of the United States' closest ally, the United Kingdom. And as you know, anyone who was under a, an illusion that he would now benefit from a due process proceeding in the United Kingdom, uh, as would have been you know, uh, inconsi- consistent with the rule of law tradition of the country uh, clearly was disappointed from the very outset. From the first day, the UK judiciary made very clear that it had no intention of granting Julian Assange a due process proceeding because that would have meant that this whole extradition case would have been thrown out you know, very early because there is no way of legally extraditing him. So all along, with every single procedural step in this proceeding, Julian Assange uh, was uh, you know, uh, told very clearly and shown very clearly that all he could expect from the British authorities was arbitrariness and persecution. And so incrementally, this increased his stress level very quickly to levels that were life-threatening already t- two years ago. Now, this is fluctuating, obviously. Well, you, you, when you visited him back uh, in Belmarsh when he first came, I think it was April, some, uh, April or May. 9th of May. 9th of May, yeah. Um, 2019. You went there with a, a doctor as well. Uh, what what was his assessment of his, for those who don't know, of his physical health at that point in time? Yeah. Well, I can't disclose the medical diagnosis because of the, you know, the, the doctor confidentiality. But uh, as far as it is relevant for my mandate, clearly both doctors, I went every two doctors who separately from each other examined them, him, and both of them are specialized in examining torture victims. One, uh, a, a forensic expert, the other, a psychiatrist, and both came to the conclusion that he showed all the symptoms that are typical for a victim of psychological torture. So again, intense anxiety, intense distress, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder of, of the major proportions. Um, so both of them told me, and I then uh, warned the British authorities that if Uh, this pressure, this relentless pressure of his persecution and isolation and arbitrariness, if that was not relieved uh, quickly, then uh, he could rapidly enter a downward spiral that would endanger his life. That was our message to the British authorities 2019. Now, here we are two, two years later, and it begins to uh, materialize in you know a, a minor stroke for now. It seems that he has recovered medically. I haven't been able to visit or examine him, but my, my sources tell me that he has recovered for the time being, but is and is under anti- uh, uh, anti-stroke treatment, but but then you know this is usually an indicator. I'm not a medical doctor, but from experience, I can say that you know these minor strokes can be indicator uh, of 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 uh, a major or full strokes basically uh, uh, awaiting in the near future. Well, walk us through. I mean, you didn't spend 24 hours there, but envisioning seeing where he uh, where he the room that he inhabits, the prison cell that he inhabits. Walk us through, what, what, what is it like? What, what is the daily routine for those people who do not know 
that he undergoes on a 24-hour basis. Well, for most of the time, he has been uh, detained in the conditions that are equivalent to solitary confinement, which means 22 to 23, up to 24 hours alone in a cell uh, that is perhaps, uh, what would that be, six feet by nine feet in American uh, measurements, uh, three by uh, two meters um, uh, size. And now you see the, the physical conditions of detention they are in accordance with international standards in the sense that the cell is equipped, you know, it's obviously very sparse, but that's not the problem. The problem is the, the isolation, uh, which uh, on a prolonged basis uh, amounts to cruel and human or degrading treatment. Any one of us can spend a few hours alone. Uh, any one of us can perhaps even spend 48 hours alone or 20, 72, but you will then quickly realize once you're being isolated for a week or more that your thoughts start turning in circles, uh, that you start being tormented by your anxiety, what, what, what's expecting you, what's awaiting you at the end of this experience. Uh, you don't have enough access to your lawyers to prepare your defense. So this, again, increases your anxiety. Um, you don't receive information or you, know, you receive correspondence with two months delay. Um, so you're being called to a court hearing. You don't know what to expect. You're being uh, asked to answer a, a U.S. indictment you have not been a able to read. All of this increases your anxiety. You're alone with yourself 24 hours a day, basically, uh, perhaps with short interruptions of an hour or so. And, and that really uh, has a very, very harmful uh, effect to the extent that the international community agreed in its United Nations minimum standards for the treatment of all prisoners around the world, you know, regardless of the category of prisoner, that more than 15 consecutive days of isolation amounts to cruel and human degrading treatment or even torture and is in any case absolutely prohibited. Well, uh, Niels, it's not just Julian. It, it's, it, what, what is the effect? I know you haven't died, but it has had uh, obviously an impact on on his partner uh, and his children, uh, particularly his partner. Uh, you saw. I, I want to play this quick clip. She came out the other day after that decision, and we were going to play this uh, for you the other day. If Kelly has it lined up, let's let's play that clip when she. If you don't mind, I want to uh, play this for the audience out there. A very dignified, an incredible statement. But you know she's under a lot of stress. K Kelly, do you have that lined up? I... Today is International Human Rights Day. What a shame. How cynical. To have this decision on this day, to have one of the foremost, the foremost publisher, journalist of the past 50 years, in a UK prison, accused of publishing the truth about war crimes, about CIA kill teams. And in fact, every time we have a hearing, more we know more about the abusive nature, the criminal nature of this case. Julian exposed the crimes of CIA torturers, of CIA killers, and now we know that those CIA killers were planning to kill him too. How can this court, how can these courts approve an extradition request under these conditions? How can they accept an extradition to the country that plotted to kill Julian? that pro plotted to kill a publisher because of what he published. This goes to the fundamentals of press freedom and of democracy. We will fight. Every generation has an epic fight to fight, and this is ours, because Julian represents the fundamentals of what it means to live in a free society, of what it means to have press freedom, of what it means for journalists to do their jobs without being afraid of spending the left rest of their lives in prison. The UK imprisons journalists. They're imprisoning Julian 
on behalf of a foreign power which is taking an abusive, vindictive prosecution against a journalist, and this is what it's about. All right, uh, that was Stella Morris. Uh, Nils, uh, your uh, reaction to what she said and uh, expand on it uh, from where I guess you would concur with everything that she said because you've said similar things in the past. So why don't you just uh, take it from here? Oh, absolutely. Obviously, uh, uh, she's absolutely right in her assessment. It, it, it certainly, you know, absolutely, I concur. These, this confirms uh, the conclusions of my own investigation uh, that I reached after, you know, meticulously going through the evidence. As someone, I remind everybody, you know, who didn't want, I didn't want to get engaged in this case originally because I have been so strongly uh, 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 negatively affected by that public narrative uh, pushed by the media about uh, Assange for the past decade. And only when I looked into the case and I looked at the actual facts, um, I saw that nothing of that false narrative really could be proven. Uh, but I found lots of, of, of contradictions. I saw manipulation of evidence. I saw collusion between those various authorities. The authorities in their interaction with me, with my mandate, as someone who is mandated by states to do what I'm doing. I'm not an NGO. I'm not an activist. I'm not a journalist. Um, I'm actually mandated by states to, to monitor their compliance with the prohibition of torture. So they refuse to engage with me uh, in, discuss, discuss, in discussing this case. And, uh, you know, basically re refuse to, pro pro to answer questions, uh, became extremely defensive, uh, accused me of having lost my impartiality and neutrality simply because based on objective facts, I confronted them with facts and I asked them to explain to me how this was com compatible with their human rights obligations. And they basically refused to engage in any dialogue with me, which clearly uh, is, is a very bad sign because I remind you I work uh, with all UN member states, that's 193 states. And my experience is as soon as a state has evidence that the, uh, their conduct is lawful, they're very keen to present that evidence to me. Uh, so when states say they have no comment or they don't want to engage in the discussion, it is clear they have something to hide. So that is extremely shocking, particularly because we're talking about Western democracies who traditionally um, would be my allies in, you know, uh, the fight against torture around the world. And here we see uh, that they have deeply betrayed those principles uh, for political purposes uh, in persecuting Assange. Well, you know, they ignore your finding. They ignored an earlier finding by the UN uh, back in 2016 that said he was uh, illegally being, uh, you know, held. And uh, they, they said he deserved compensation and immediate release. They ignored that one, you, they've ex ignored uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, Reporters Without Borders, the ACLU, and a whole, you know, a uh, hundred different organizations. Is this a pre-written script to you? And what you're doing is getting in the way of the final chapter? My impression really is that uh, the latest since his uh, expulsion from the embassy and probably much earlier, uh, what we're witnessing is just the, you know, a plot being played out according to the script, and that anything that comes into, in the way uh, is removed, you know, by any means uh, uh, necessary. Um, and, and, and it just speaks to the fact of how threatened states feel by the mechanism that WikiLeaks has, has offered. And again, uh, let's just be very clear, all they do is offer a platform where whistleblowers can submit secret information about the providing evidence about uh, serious misconduct by states. Now, in any democracy, the public should know about misconduct uh, you know, uh, of states. So if, they're, if they don't know that, it, it is because the media, the mainstream media is not doing their job. And so it is no surprise that an actor like WikiLeaks appears. Um, but that's an absolutely essential function in any democracy because without transparency, uh, without access to what's really going on, to the truth of what's really going on behind uh, closed doors in government circles. We cannot be democracies. We cannot oversee 
what our governments are doing with our tax money and with the power we have delegated to them. So it's an absolutely essential function. And what we, if, if anyone is still under the illusion that these states are prosecuting Assange in good faith, um, then just look at what he's being accused of, receiving and publishing secret information as someone who has no duty of non-disclosure, who's not an American citizen, has not been in the United States, who has no contract with the United States. He's simply a publisher. On the other hand, however, he has provided evidence for the most serious crimes recognized by the international community, uh, such as torture, murder of civilians, and, and very grave corruption. And none of these acts has ever been prosecuted. We are talking with Niels Melzer, the Special Rapporteur on Torture at the UN. Uh, in a minute, we'll be talking, uh, we'll, we'll be joined by uh, Gillian Assange's brother, uh, Gabriel Shipton. Um, we see you. I, I just want to, uh, I, I want you to stick around, Niels. Um, uh, I want to ask you, um, so I got, I got a feeling like, that you believe that the authorities in the U.S., the prosecutors here and uh, in the U.K. Uh, didn't lose much sleep over this, um, uh, you know, recent uh, medical uh, condition or, or, or the stroke. Uh, they're pro Do you actually think that they, it's okay for them if he just wilts away and dies? Well, I, obviously I cannot speak for the authorities, but they clearly uh, have no sense of responsibility for the health and, you know, for the rule of law in general. Because let's remind everybody that there is no case against Julian Assange that could be called lawful in any sense. He has not broken any law. You know, he, he's, he's, he's published true information at providing evidence for serious crimes. That's, that's what he has done, while those governments are responsible for serious crimes. Uh, so clearly they have a self-interest in trying to avoid accountability and maintain their impunity. Uh, it's just very important for the public to realize what the truth is about this case. Um, for them, I think all that matters is to try to silence Julian Assange and to very visibly to the public demonstrate that if ever you, someone else, another journalist or any activist should have the idea of publishing secret information provided to them, uh, proving misconduct by uh, uh, those powerful states, then this is what we're going to do with you. And it's going to be unlawful. It's even going to be blatantly unlawful. And we're going to demonstrate to you that no one will be able to protect you from it. And my argument is that, you know, irrespective of whether Julian Assange is in the end is extradited to the US or not, or whether he dies in a UK prison uh, or, or is institutionalized in this closed psych psychiatric institution, what matters is that intimidation is working already. Uh, journalists today will certainly hesitate uh, when you pro if you provided them with a USB stick and the collateral murder video number two and the next 250,000 dip diplomatic cables. Uh, would they be as keen as they were in 2010 and 11 to publish those things at, you know, New York Times and uh, the, the Guardian and El País and uh, Le Monde and the Spiegel? Or would they now perhaps uh, rather hesitate and look at what has been done to Julian Assange? This is my point. This demonstrates that the intimidation is working already. Well, you mentioned collateral damage, and I think we have, uh, I, I think people who are not familiar with it, that may be only a few out there, uh, but we should, uh, if Kelly has that lined up, let's play that short clip uh, from collateral damage. You have that set up, Kelly? I see it. I just can't hear it. Oh, there you go. Texas, but that's a two Texas. Got a bunch of bodies laying there. Uh, we got about uh, eight individuals. Yeah, we got one guy crawling around down there, but uh, yeah, we could definitely get him Or shoot some more. Hey, you shoot out, boss. Hotel two six, crazy horse one eight. 
All right. Okay, you get the point there. Uh, that was the full video, which seemed longer than Platoon. Uh, uh, and it's ghastly. Um, I'm just going to get a comment from you. Stick around, Nils. That's the crime. That's that's what put him in, basically, showing that. Well, yeah, well, we have not seen the, actually, the decisive part where um, the, the, the helicopter team actually fired on that wooden person that we saw at the end. Uh, about a minute later, you will see a bus coming in, try a, mini, a civilian minibus trying to rescue the person. Uh, and clearly, as you know, a law of war uh, expert uh, for the International Committee of the Red Cross at the time already as a legal advisor, I analyze these types of operations all the time. And, and it is obvious that even if someone were a combatant, in this case, this wounded man is not a combatant, he's actually a journalist. Uh, and, and he, he wasn't armed, he wasn't participating in the fighting. But even if he had been before, once he's wounded, there's an absolute protection for wounded, uh, you know, uh, persons, civilians and combatants. And the soldiers know that exactly. And that same protection applies to people trying to rescue uh, the wounded. Uh, and so we, what we see uh, just a minute later, but that's a very gruesome scene really, uh, is that, that the, the helicopter team intentionally, deliberately, when they see that this person is being rescued, they basically massacre him and the rescuers. Uh, and uh, in that minibus are even were uh, two children who were gravely wounded. They survived, but they were wounded. Um, and that is without any question a war crime. Uh, there is no, there is no discussion, you know, because this is nothing to do with engaging in legitimate combat. And the soldiers know that. Uh, and so that really was the most kind of scandalous revelation, the initial uh, video of the collateral murder um, uh, uh, clip. And, uh, and, and, and that was the, the, the opening of, of the 2010 uh, publications that then continued with the Afghan war diary and the Iraq war logs, and then uh, culminated also in the, the, the cable gate uh, uh, publications. All right, Niels Melzer, stick around. Uh, we are joined now um, by the brother of Julian Assange, Gabriel Shipton, who I have not seen in over 12 hours. Uh, Gabriel and I hooked up, and I was telling everybody that we were stuck on the subway for 
what seemed like a year down there, but very hot. Uh, Gabriel, um, you knew about this, or did you not know about uh, the stroke by your brother uh, that he had uh, back in October 24th, I think, 26th? Tell us about Yeah, well, it. Um, you know, I think you would, those images we saw of Julian back on back on those uh, on those hearing days, those images of him uh, from the video link room at, at, at Belmarsh. Um, none of us realised at the time, but um, you know he was you know <laughs> he was having you know suffering from the uh, symptoms of that of that mini stroke. So just looking back on that on that is just like um you know so uh i mean you know it's just it's unbelievable what he's going through you know like uh you know it's hard to put into hard to put into words hard to describe um you know julia it's not belmarsh prison is not uh it's not like you can just go down to the hospital or whatever or go to a doctor you know it, it's uh still a maximum security prison so the medical treatment there is good but it's not um you know it's not what you would get uh, if he was if he was out on bail back at home, um, which you know he should he should just be back on bail. Basically, he should be back with his family, which I think um, is really the big push that we should make at the moment. Uh, he's I don't know what you think about this, Niels, but the you know because they've found uh, you know they approved the appeal on on those two points, uh, you know, saying that he. Uh, uh, should be extradited or the magistrate's court should order his extradition. Um, you know, Julian will appeal. He, we will fight it. But because the um, extradition is approved, uh, that would, to me, uh, give them more reason not to give him bail. Uh, so this next series of appeals, uh, I would imagine they're, they're going to keep him in prison because this threat of extradition is is now uh, even... even um, you know, more present. Niels? Yeah, well, of course, obviously I'm not part of the legal team and I don't know what their strategy uh, is. Uh, I can just say that from, you know, an international law perspective, there is no legal basis for keeping him in a high security prison. Uh, even, you know, I mean, there is no even a legal basis for the extradition proceeding. I mean, given all those grave violations that have been committed at the surveillance and, you know, this, the, the, you know, the basically uh, the prevention uh, of sufficient access to his legal team to, to prepare his defense. I mean, those we don't even have to start talking about kidnapping and assassination plots. I mean, and, 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 and even, you know, what's the, the, the crime that they're accusing him of? There is no crime even. So, I mean, there really is no case, no criminal case against him. There is no legitimate extradition case. Uh, the U.S.-U.K. treaty clearly prohibits extradition for, you know, political offenses such as espionage. So all, all of this has no legal basis. But even if we forget about all of this, just for the purpose of the argument and say, well, there's a legitimate extradition uh, proceeding going on. Yes, you can ensure his presence, um, you know, in case he should be extradited at the end of that proceeding, which can go on for another couple of years. Um, but you can't use measures that are beyond what's absolutely necessary, the, the, the minimum that's necessary in terms of restriction. And that's not a high security prison for someone who's nonviolent, not endangering anybody, uh, not having committed any crime uh, you know, uh, at all. Uh, so in his case, obviously house arrest is the maximum you could lawfully do. Yeah. Um, and that's that certainly is something that that uh, you know the, the authorities of themselves should do that. It shouldn't be necessary to apply for it because it's it's un, it's plainly unlawful what they're doing. He should be at home, exercising his profession, living his family life, and you know if we admit, as I said, for the purpose of the argument, although I don't agree with it legally, that there is a, a valid extradition case then possibly at the end of that proceeding, mm. he could be arrested. But uh, there is no, there, there's basically no legal basis for the way he's being treated. Niels Melzer, a new and rapporteur on torture, uh, special rapporteur on torture. I'm Randy Critical, Randy Critical, live on the fly here on the Progressive Radio Network. Uh, 
the uh, producer and I believe the director of a film called Ithaca, which features Julian's father and your father, um, John Shipton. Uh, it's a big hit. It's playing, I believe, in Gabriel Shipton uh, in uh, Sydney. Hopefully uh, people can see it. And, and of course, read your book, uh, Niels. I'm going to talk about your book in a minute. So uh, Gabriel, what, uh, what kind of toll has this taken on your father and uh, what you know about uh, Stella because you're really close with both of them. Yeah, I, look, I spoke to John um, yesterday and he's, you know, it's, uh, you know, particularly low moment, um, try and keep it all in perspective uh, and, and look at, um, you know, what's, what's in the future, what steps can we take now to, you know, keep fighting for Julian's freedom. Um, you know, and try and look at it as I think this was always going to end up in the Supreme Court uh, by either side. Uh, and so this is just, you know, one step closer to the European Court of Human Rights, which I think uh, we, uh, you know, I think everyone's, you know, I think that's our best chance of getting, uh, you know, Julian, Julian out. So uh, this is try and put it in perspective and look at this as, a, as, as the next step towards towards the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, I think at the moment, uh, what this judgment says is that the US, people in the USA can no longer deny that that, uh, that uh, this case is, is, is going to come to them uh, eventually. You know, the, 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 they can't rely on the British courts to reject this extradition. Uh, you know, the chief magistrate uh, the highest judge in England and Wales has ruled, has approved this extradition. So it becomes very difficult uh, to appeal that ruling. So I think the people in, uh, in particularly in the DOJ or, or in the Congress or in the Biden administration, they need to take a stand on this case now. You know, they can't, they can no longer rely on the British courts. They can uh, no longer afford to ignore it. It is coming uh, and they need to take a position and, uh, yeah, I think I think that's what we need to do, and we're doing this protest uh, tomorrow. Is that right, Randy? At, yes, at uh, noon in New York City, in front of the uh, British UK uh, consulate on Forty Seventh and Second Avenue, a sizable amount of people are coming. I know you'll be there. Margaret, yep. uh, Margaret Kunstler is coming, uh, and I'll be there. And uh, and so uh, I'm. I'm. Let me ask you, Niels, what. What are our options right now? Is that it? Getting on the street? Uh, you know, people reading your book. Uh, do we need to influence public opinion? Well, I mean, clearly the the institutions of you know of the state are are failing before our eyes, and they have been failing for a decade in in his case. Uh, whether from you know in Sweden or the UK during the extradition proceeding to Sweden, uh, even the Ecuadorian. Uh, institutions. Once then, he was being, you know, he he was expelled uh, from the embassy and and the U.S. institutions. So that's and and even now with the United Nations, uh, I, I make the same experience, and that is really extremely concerning because it means that we have a systemic failure. It's not just you know a, a bump in the road. It's really a a black hole where you can say. As soon as those perceived national security interests are at stake, um, and, and there really aren't national security interests, there are impunity interests of officials that have committed serious crimes. That's what this is really about. Um, as soon as those interests of the powerful are at stake, democracy and the rule of law no longer functions. And that, I think, really points to what this is about uh, and and why this is something that everybody mm. and their kids should be worried about. What what kind of world is being created here in front of my eyes? That's the reason why, uh, because through the diplomatic channels at the disposal of my office, I could no longer uh, achieve uh, a compliance by those states with international law. I decided to inform the public about the system, systemic failure, and that's what this book is about. Uh, that I uh, uh, have, have written that will be published uh, in February uh, in, in Verso Books. This is this is what it looks like: the it, trial of Julian Assange. 
a story think, of persecution. Yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's uh, fantastic that you've written that book, Niels, because you know, often talk about this is that the persecution of Julian is another. It's like another revelation. It's like another WikiLeaks revelation. It's um, exposed uh, all these institutions. It's exposed corruption at every level. Um, so, you know, it's not only the WikiLeaks revelations that. Uh, you know, exposed uh, war crimes and torture and things like that. Uh, the persecution of Julian has has also done the same thing. And, and, and I think it's a book like yours that can map that out. I think that, you know, it's really, I hope it has an effect on, on that we're able to sort of look back at this and, and, and um, you know, rebuild, uh, you know, in 10 years time or, or, or something like that. But um, I think, yeah, it's a great effort. Well, that, that, I think that's the only thing that's, that's left to us, that, that you know, we, we make people understand that this is not, you know, I know it's about uh, Julian Assange for you and his father and for himself and for his partner and his children and his friends, but it's really for the rest of us out here. It's, it's about us. You know, I want to say to anybody watching this, it's about you and your rights and, and, and your children's rights. And you know your your right to know what your government is doing with your tax money and and the power you have delegated to it, and it's really if you know if this goes down the drain, excuse my French, um, we're going to be living in a in a tyranny, and and nobody's rights will be safe. And so I feel that what's really important is that the media start assuming their role as the fourth estate here, and they hold those governments to account. That they start asking uncomfortable questions. I am convinced if the main news outlets in the US, in the UK, in Australia confronted their own governments with the real question rather than just reporting, you know, the he said and she said of, of the court proceedings, but actually asked uncomfortable questions about what this really is about and why none of the war crimes and none of the torture uh, incidents and none of the corruption cases has ever been prosecuted that WikiLeaks brought evidence for. Uh, why, you know, why is the justice system being turned upside down in this case? I, I'm convinced that this could stop this case completely in its tracks and, and, and could uh, bring uh, Assange to, to freedom uh, because, because that's what the governments are afraid of, is the spotlight. That's precisely why they're persecuting him. Because mm -hmm. That's precisely what WikiLeaks has done. If the main media institutions started doing that job again, that would be the end of his persecution. The, the name of the book is um, The Trial of Julian Assange in English. And uh, I've, uh, I've sent some, I know you have, uh, advanced copies or PDF versions. And if there are journalists out there who are listening on Monday or watching this later, uh, you would be happy to send them uh, a PDF file or an advanced copy because I think now it's critical for them to get their hands on it before February so they can see, because uh, you've done such an incredible diagnosis of what happened and what is happening here. Uh, so, but uh, getting back to where do we go from here? I know that we have to inform if we got the journalists out there in the media, big media to take this seriously, that would be helpful. The demonstrations would be helpful. I mean, you know, Gabriel, what, you know, it's like we can't sit here and despair and, and you know, and feel hopeless. We got to do something. Yeah, I think, you know, that protest on Monday is a great example. Direct action, you know, it's very, very powerful. We're going to get what is uh, the uh, asses of the masses, I think you say, Red, yes. in American. Um, but, yeah, I think direct action is very powerful as well as, uh, you know, what's worked in Australia is, uh, con contacting your elected representative, you know, but just call them, call them every day if you have to, um, you know, just keep on, keep on telling them that, you know, you care about your right to know, you know, and, and, and what this case means um, to everybody, to your democratic rights, to, um, you know, that you care what happens with your tax dollars, that you care, uh, you know, what, you, what, what is done in your name. So I, I think, you know, ring your elected officials, you know, whether it's Congress people or whether it's a politician in Australia, I don't know if this is going internationally, but um, 
yeah, write to them, uh, write to your elected officials, just put the pressure on. Uh, another another uh, thing that can be done is a small small local petition uh, and given to your Congress people. We've had success with that uh, in the US. Um, some some organizers locally in Massachusetts are able to get meetings with uh, Congress staffers uh, by filling out a petition and, and presenting it uh, to the Congress people or senators. So, uh, you know, that's another another way to do it. Those small localized petitions are made up of people in the constituency uh, and you can you can take those to the Congress people to get meetings to, to express uh, your concern about about what this case means uh, for your rights. Niels, you continue uh, to be out there. You're, you're, you're incredible. You're the uh, ever ready rabbit that just keeps going and going and going. And I don't sense a sense of demoralization in you. I think that you uh, are going to be working relentlessly in every capacity that you're capable of uh, to move forward and try to get some relief here. Well, look, it's as I said, this is, this is obviously an important case for Julian Assange himself, but he is as important as anybody else who is being subjected to torture, and we have millions of victims in the world. But my real concern is what this means for, you know, for the rule of law and human rights and the sustainability of Western democracy. Um, and, and that's a very important issue that I really feel, if I can use my mandate for something, uh, it is to draw attention to what's really going on behind the scenes here, and uh, and and you know to to wake people up. It's 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 a wake up call. Uh, also, my my interventions are my public statements are my book is uh, the the purpose is to to wake people up to what's actually going on and what's happening to their world, and what kind of world we're about to create. It's a world where it has become a crime tell the truth. It is a world where the criminals have the right to classify the evidence against them. Imagine if you bring a murderer to court and the murderer has the right to classify all the evidence against him and anybody disclosing it will be punished. That is the reality already today under the Espionage Act is the reality today under the Official Secrets Act in the UK. And lo and behold, Sweden is about to create its own Espionage Act. It is. It's already approved by Parliament. It will enter into force in, in January 2023. That makes it a crime for anybody to disclose secret information that could harm Sweden's relations to another state or international organization. I mean, Sweden was chosen by WikiLeaks in 2010 as a potential uh, host state because it was the safe haven of press freedom in the world. So we're that far now that this country is adopting the same approach. Look at Australia persecuting whistleblowers and, you know, uh, having similar interpretations of secrecy laws as, as the UK and the US. We're really going worldwide in this direction. And I think the citizens of Western democracies have become too comfortable. They take their freedoms for granted. And as one of the most important quotes in my book is by a German resistance lawyer during the Second World War who uh, opposed the Nazis. And he said, basically, uh, if you fall asleep in a democracy, you will wake up in a tyranny. And that's exactly the situation we are in right now. And most people are just still sleeping. Yeah, well, uh, I, I agree. We the other day we were talking uh, with Roger Waters. In fact, I know he's watching. If he uh, texts me, we'll, we'll have him join us. Um, uh, and uh, he, of course, has been a very powerful figure in this movement. And uh, Gabriel, we need more Roger Waters out there at this point in time. Uh, why aren't there more people like him? I mean, he's in a class by himself as an activist, as a, a, a legendary uh, musician and songwriter. Uh, 
why aren't there more out there? Have you approached other artists? I know um, there are some in, in, in London that have been there, but on the level of a Roger Waters, why aren't there more? Would you well, I think, you know, we're, obviously there's been uh, years and years of, uh, of, of these sort of uh, attacks on Julian through the press, you know, destroying his character. Um, they really have done a wonderful job at, at giving him the sort of ick factor um, that has put a lot of a lot of people off on, on this case. But uh, it's starting though, I think the momentum is changing. We're, we're really sort of making some, you know, ground now, I think, and, and, and there are other people becoming interested, uh, you know, obviously things like your book, Niels, um, through the film that, that we did with uh, John and Stella, you know, these things, uh, we are we're changing uh, changing the narrative around this case. We're we're um, telling a different perspective uh, than what people experience through the media. And so you know now we're seeing I think more and more people uh, coming on board. Uh, this decision yesterday has galvanised people. Uh, people realise now that you know this is not going the court. They they can't rely on the English justice system. This is not this is not going to stop. Uh, and it's going to continue. And so people are, are waking up um, and, you know, there's a this protest plan, which will, I think is going, I think we're going to be very surprised at the number of people that are down there tomorrow. And yeah, uh, you know, we're, people are going to start coming on. We're going to get more and more people joining us. Uh, you know, Roger Waters, obviously he's, le he's led the way. Um, you know, there are other celebrities uh, who, are, who are involved and that's great. Uh, you know, Hugo Weaving, an Australian actor, he came and watched uh, Ithaca at the premiere in Sydney at Sydney Film Festival. And he came out of the cinema and, and you know, made a statement about, about the case. So he, there's people who are always joining uh, and, and we have to engage them through, you know, things like books and films and, and, and show them a different uh, side of this story and wake them up. Yeah, that's right. They have to wake up, uh, wake up to what's really happening. And once they realise, once they realise what is actually happening and what is actually going on, uh, then you know it's hard for them to to not join this cause. Like, well, why wouldn't you, uh, you know, join this cause if you actually knew what was going on? So, I think you know the work that we're doing, the work that you do, Randy, is is also uh, you know integral to this to this changing, you know, convincing people and telling them telling them what's really going on. I, I want you guys to stick around for uh, a few more minutes. Uh, Niels uh, not only uh, is a great activist, a great lawyer, and uh, his writer of books, um, but he also plays the piano. And uh, we're, we're going to take a quick break here. We're going to say goodbye uh, to our audience at the Progressive Radio Network and, and come back uh, with some of the activists, Katie Halper uh, and uh our friends uh, here from NYC, Free Assange, uh, because they're both going to be there tomorrow at the demonstration. Can you guys hold on? We're going to play this. This is, I don't know which clip this is, but this is Niels Melzer on the piano, and we'll be right back. That's beautiful, Nils. If Kelly uh, could send uh, Roger Waters a link uh, to this show, he'd like to join us. Uh, so uh, I know, Gabriel, you got to jump off, but uh, stick around until he uh, uh, comes back uh, with us. Uh, uh, what is, uh, how much longer are you going to be in town, by the way? And, and, and while you're here, uh, you must have some plans. I, I don't, they, they may be private and involved 
Julian, but I, I know um, that you're going to be here for a few more days. And um, people who want to contact you and uh, show some support to the movie or whatever, people need to feel like they have an outlet to do something uh, here. So if you could uh, possibly uh, tell us uh, how people can reach you, how they can access that film. Yeah, you can uh, follow me on Twitter at Gabriel Shipton. My DM, my, you can DMs are open, so yeah, just send me a message and can respond to those. Uh, Gabriel Shipton at protonmail.com is my email. If you want to, you know, message me on email, uh, G A B R I E L S H I P T O N at protonmail.com. Uh, I'm here, I'm in the States, I think till next week, uh, till the end of next week, uh, we're doing, you know, uh, as much media as we can, uh, trying to, you know, just get, get the message out there about, about, uh, you know, Julian's prosecution and, and, or the persecution of Julian and, and what it means, uh, what it means to people, uh, you know, it's about them. It's about their rights, their right to know. So yeah, just pushing out that message here, um, obviously uh after the judgment there's a lot of interest um you know people uh i think I, I think finding people are outraged um you know i've got a lot of contacts in the in the sort of uh crypto community uh and they're all sort of galvanizing now um there's gonna there's a, a you know a free assange movement developing there so there's there's a lot of stuff going on and and a lot of people uh, are galvanizing around this decision, which I, which is, in, you know, obviously it's a, it's a bad, bad decision, but, um, in, in a way it's, uh, woken some people up, which is, which is helpful. Okay. Uh, we're going to put on for a minute here, uh, uh before we go to Roger, uh, Chuck Slatkin, Chuck, can you give us, uh, if you're there, uh, yes. information for tomorrow, uh, at, uh, the demonstration. Chuck is okay. for Assange. It's important uh, for people to be aware of the fact that, yes, tomorrow is the day at 12 noon at 885 Second Avenue, which is the northwest uh, corner of uh, Second Avenue and 47th Street. We will be there in front of the British consulate to let the world know how we feel and that it's important for people to get out and speak, take action, because, uh, you know, uh, that's what's left is us. So we really have to be out there and, and, and fight for the freedom for Julian Assange. How do people reach uh, NYC Free Assange? Well, uh, NYC Free Assange, uh, at NYC Free Assange Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, and uh, we have a website, uh, w, uh, www.nycfreeassange.org. Uh, so we're accessible that way. Uh, thank you, uh, Chuck. I, I'm going to go back to you, Nils, here, because Kelly uh, brought this up about the study uh, by the uh, neuroscientists that was po totally dismissed by, I think, can you, you talk about this a few weeks ago? I, I'm not, a, I, I don't remember. Uh, is there something uh, with the neuroscientists? They had some kind of study that they found that they went to either the UN and then they went through some assembly and it was dismissed. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're referring to, Randy. I'm sorry. Well, I obviously. Uh, uh, well, let me just go ahead and say, why are they dismissing everything that's thrown at them? Everybody, the, 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 the um, you know, you know, Crown prosecutors, their their uh, involvement with the uh, Swedes, uh, the, the FOIA stuff, the, the uh, UC Global stuff, uh, the. Uh, Attempts on his life uh, by the CIA, uh, possibly. And then, of course, uh, all of the, this is Ziggy. I mean, there's so much stuff in his favor, uh, Julian. Why are they dismissing all of this? Well, because they want, obviously, they want to silence him because he's exposing their, their dirty secrets. Look, for, for, the, for the broader public, it's important for them to understand that what's going on here is that that there's a powerful elite that tries to protect themselves through secrecy and to grant themselves impunity. This has never been about national security because when asked by, even by the British judges, the US has been unable to point to any 
security risks that has been actually caused by those by those uh, by those revelations of WikiLeaks. And we're talking about literally hundreds of thousands of documents. Not a single one has actually posed a security threat. Uh, threat. So this is not about national security. And I, I remind you, and perhaps for those who don't know, in 2013, uh, when he was presided, the so-called elders, uh, former president, U.S. President Jimmy Carter reacted uh, when he was asked to uh, to comment on the revelations of WikiLeaks. He said that he actually didn't oppose, did not oppose those himself. That he that he he said that in his view, secrecy most of the time is not being used by government agents for legitimate purposes, but to cover up for their own misconduct. So even a former U.S. president recognized that. And so this is the reality. And the public should start realizing that here legal institutions are being intentionally, deliberately abused for political purposes, for self-serving purposes of granting impunity to themselves for the most serious crimes that have ever been codified by humanity, speaking of torture and war crimes. This is what this is about. This is not about anything like bail violation, come on, and or or disclosing uh, you know, you know, secret evidence for, for I mean, what's what's the crime here? It's it's once you you see behind the curtain, it becomes very simple. This is what this is about. And our society should decide whether, you know, do we want this? Do we want to be governed by a small minority that can grant itself impunity for the most serious crimes, that can exploit the rest of humanity with impunity? And you as a citizen who is actually supposed in a democracy to govern, um, if, you, if you allow yourself to ask questions, to hold your government to account, you are going to be called a spy and a traitor. And those who give you the evidence for what's going on are, being to, are going to be called criminals. Do you really want to live in a world like this? Ask yourself, because that's what's happening. Niels Mills, the name of the book is The Trial of Julian Assange. Roger Waters uh, joins us uh, from the studio, I believe. Uh, Roger, good seeing you again, and thank you for joining us. Uh, your thoughts about all that you saw uh, today and, and the news about Julian having uh, this stroke. Well, it's devastating, obviously, uh, emotionally. I can't, I can't imagine how Gabriel's feeling, you know, or Stella or John. Uh, but I've been watching you since three o'clock when you started this program. And uh, there's, there, there's sort of very little I can add to what Nils has been saying so eloquently for the last hour. Um, it's weird. It, it's a bit like you feel like uh, he's like Thor with a hammer and he's kind of going around the world banging these morons over the head. And, and I'm not I'm, I'm talking about the politicians, obviously, part here, but I'm talking about the rest of us and saying, wake up, wake up. This is your world they're destroying. This is your freedom that's being destroyed. This is the beginning of the end of you having, not that you ever really had a say in any of this bullshit, but this is absolutely the end of anybody being allowed to speak the truth about anything that doesn't suit them. You know, well, I well, sent about, a tweet earlier, right? I sent, uh, I actually, I retweeted that this was going out not long ago, a few minutes ago. Uh, I saw it. Well, if you're not watching it, I said, you know, you should be watching it, especially Biden and Blinken and Boris effing Johnson, because you're cowards, <clears throat> you're cowardly scum, the three of you. But more important than who you are personally and how you behave, you are letting the rest of us down. You are letting us sink into this morass of tyranny where nobody is allowed to speak. I was I'm, I was sitting here just now, apart from thinking, oh Christ, I hope my hair looks all right, you know, because I haven't got a comb. But I was listening to what Niels was saying about the Swedes and about how they have passed a law, a, a, their own official secrets act, that it will become illegal in Sweden 
for uh, for anybody to say anything but i think i think what he said was that might contribute in a negative way to sweden's relationship with other states so it's like this is a private club and human beings are not invited this is for these things called states to deal one with another i mean last week i was sitting watching the uh, aftermath of a court proceeding in the hague where my friend ismail ziada was told no you cannot sue uh, benny gantz and the bloke who dropped the bomb and killed six members of your family on july the 21st 2014 in gaza no you can't sue them because they're protected by sovereign immunity and the immunity of the but we're, we're so can I ever take out a civil suit because they've destroyed my life completely? They killed my mother and my father and a brother and a blah 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 blah. Um, no, you can't. Oh my goodness! But I thought there was you... supposed to be something called international humanitarian law. Well, there is. Niels could tell us a lot more about it than I could. I know I'm changing the subject, and I don't mean to because I actually was listening just now to what gabriel was saying about how we are or, or maybe it's not we maybe it's the fact that the powers that be that the ruling elite are behaving so appallingly badly and have done for the last 10 years in the case of julian assange that they've actually stumbled over themselves in their desire to protect themselves and their calumny and their infamy all right, that, that actually they've stumbled into the blaze of a searchlight that is being shone on them by you and by Niels Meltzer and his new book that, that well, is coming out on February the 8th here in this country. It's been out in Germany, in German. My German's not all that good, so I haven't been able to read it yet, but, I, but as soon as I can get hold of an English version, I'm going to, because listening to the... Niels, Niels uh, do you concur or is that all hyperbole, what we just heard from the great Roger Waters? No, clearly. I mean, that's, that's what this is about, right? It's really about the world that's being created before our eyes. And, uh, you know, do we want to participate in this world or do we want the 99% of us leave it to 1%, you know, of the world's population governing us just according to their own uh, interests and granting themselves impunity for their crimes. Absolutely. Uh, look, this is a decisive time. Uh, all we can do is offer this truth uh, to people or they will find out sooner or later but in a painful, much more painful way than we're already finding out now. Yeah. Well, the thing is, that, yeah, what can we do? Well, Chuck, I was listening to what you were saying as well. Yeah, I'll be there. Do I want to do New York tomorrow? No, I haven't done. I can't think of anything I want to do less than going to New York tomorrow. But I'll bloody well be there outside the British consulate at noon tomorrow, right. standing with my brothers and sisters and saying, don't let these MFs destroy our planet with their tyranny. And this is, you know, the way they're treating Julian, you have to put yourself in this. How would you feel if it was you? We always have to do that. That is what empathy is. We have to be able to put ourselves into the shoes of another human being. And it doesn't matter if it's Ismail Ziada being, his family being wiped out before his eyes in Gaza, or if it's our brother, Julian Assange, being slowly murdered by the UK government at the behest of the United States of America government in Belmarsh prison. Put yourself in those. I can't even begin to. When you were talking, Niels, about how if you're alone for an hour, eh, it's not too bad. Two, eight hours is pushing it a bit. Ten hours, 12 hours is a long time to be alone. 16 hours, now you're beginning to crawl up the walls. Okay. 20, two years of that? Oh my God. I mean, I, I, the pounding in my head when I even think about it is making me almost weep with frustration, you know, so none of us can possibly imagine what it's like for Julian.
and the thousands of others in a similar position, you know, who've heard the jackboot kicking in the door and have been dragged off and incarcerated with no recourse to the law. And that's a, that's a fundamental thing, you know. I talk about it a lot in songs because it's in my it's in my mind and in my heart every mo every breath I take almost I think just imagine no recourse to the law well Julian hasn't because as Niels has pointed out again and again and again and again till he's blue in the face there is no legal basis for Julian Assange's being in prison even for a minute. Mm. Never mind for two and a half years or for the rest of his days, you know. So, yeah, let's get passionate about it. And let's call these assholes out for what they are because they are scum that they allow this to happen. Anyway, well, I will be there, Randy. I'll be there. That's great. Uh, isn't that good news, um, yeah. uh, Gabriel? Gabriel? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll, we'll be down there on the street. Uh, <laughs> doing our thing so well, yeah, on, the street, on the street that's the important bit right. we we had a similar conversation like a few days ago um on randy's on randy's uh program again and, and this is this is what pilger was saying you know he was saying the streets we have to take to the streets we can't and you know there was almost a slight punch up in the public bar because some of us were trying to bang on about the First Amendment and this and that, and other of us were getting somewhat uh, frustrated at that because it's very parochial. There's always a lot of talk about America and this and that. Now, well, this isn't, it is a problem specifically now with Julian because the bad players in this are the governments of the United States of America and the government of the United Kingdom at the moment. But these are the arch devils. These are the people we boo in the pantomime when we're children, when they come on stage. Boo! You know, but they are not alone. You know, behind all of this is the monster of, well, I'm not, well, the, the monster of neoliberal capitalist economic policies and the way it divides us one from another and actually it's probably the fundamental reason why this bullshit is allowed to proceed i know that's somewhat another subject and another matter and it is but this is so important people are just ignoring it it just being ignored i i should be very interested to see how many of us there are on the street god please I know it's inconvenient. Please get out of your beds tomorrow. Come. I, I think you we'll be in there. You be in there. Well, you be in there will bring a lot more people, and uh, and I, I we're going to put that out tonight. I know Bernadette's going to be sending it out on NYC Free Assange as we speak. Uh, and I, I look, uh, this could go on forever. This conversation. I think we're all feeling a little doleful right now yeah. uh, from the back to back. First a decision, and then this news about him suffering a stroke. Uh, so it's a, a one-two punch, and uh, I'm trying to stay energized. I will be out there tomorrow. Uh, and uh, let me just get some closing remarks. Uh, let me go to you, okay. people. I, I know you just be go. Before that, I just want to repeat where it is tomorrow so people will know if they just tuned in late. That's 2nd Avenue and 47th Street in New York City. Uh, 885 Second Avenue at 12 noon. Be there, we'll be there. And remember the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the right to petition the government. Well, the UK Council, it may just be the branch office, but we're going to be out there with speech, assembling, and petitioning. Well, I may do a Henry David Thoreau thing. I just read Civil Disobedience yesterday and wait for Emerson to come in and say, why are you in jail for blocking the British embassy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, all right, so thank you for that, Chuck. I'm gonna go to you, um, Gabriel, cause I know you gotta go. Then we'll go uh, to Roger and Niels, you'll close mm -hmm. it. Just some closing remarks here before we go, get all the frustration out of you right now. No, well, I think, you know, this is, wasn't a decision that we wanted, uh, you know, so, but I, turn it into a positive. I think uh, it's really galvanized people and and 
I can feel I can feel some momentum around people who the outrage is there and um, it's going to convert into something. I, I think I can feel that. So, yeah, looking forward to Monday and, and continuing on uh, this fight to free Julian. All right, Niels, you go now and then we'll close with the poet. Well, you know, receiving the news of this decision of the appeals court on the 10th of December, 2021. The 10th of December is the International Day of Human Rights. The 10th of December 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN General Assembly in the hope, you know, that we would create a better future. And this decision basically cancels out the, the core of the essence of what the Universal Declaration of human rights is is about it is is the negation of it it's the antithesis of human rights and this was clear to me already when i saw that verdict and i when i learned that during that hearing julian assange actually had a stroke and the judges obviously when they decided a few weeks, uh, weeks later that they would extradite him to the us they were aware of that and I remind you, this hearing was about whether Julian Assange's health is strong enough to withstand an extradition and a show trial in the U.S. Now, isn't that the, I mean, the culmination of, of, of cynicism, that a hearing that where the defendant cannot even follow the hearing because his state of health is so weak and he's even having a stroke during that hearing and then the judges come to the decision that he can be extradited to the u.s based on some set of flimsy assurances that everybody who just takes the time to read those five points of those assurances will immediately realize that the u.s has not given any assurances whatsoever that they have kept all their options open i mean it's just so blatant, yes, the, as perhaps as others have just said, the only positive thing is that now the abuse, the, you know, the grotesque level of abuse has become so obvious that really even the blind can see it. So I really just invite people to, to, to look, it, look, look reality in the face as long as you can still change it. Because very soon it, this will be taken out of your hands and all of us will have become just part of a mass of people that will be maneuvered by those in power. Roger, uh, you're closing the show. Well, Kelly, you're in the background there somewhere. I want you to write out a transcript of what Neil's just said. And I'm going to stand up tomorrow in the street and pretend to be him and read out what he just said. <laughs> because there's no way I could put it better than that. That is so eloquent, but it is so, it's like a punch on the effing nose to these assholes, that, because it's irrefutable. And I hope Vanessa Berritzer was watching that and was listening to it. And I hope that her heart was sinking. I hope she was flushed bright red. I hope she turned to stone in the face of that and went, what have I done? Realizing that what she has done is being a mindless, faithless, humorless, um, emotion-free puppet for the ruling elite. That she has nothing to do with the law, nothing to do with justice, and more importantly, nothing to do with the sacred platform upon which we all stand, which is that Declaration of Human Rights in, on the 10th of December in Paris in 1948. Without that platform for us all to stand on, we're all dead. Wow. Well, somebody out there, uh, if you're listening, uh, please uh, take the uh, video of this on YouTube and translate or transcribe what uh, Dr. Nils Melzer just read. And uh, Nils, uh, you really are, you're all heroes of mine. Uh, Nils, uh, you've been such a special envoy 
uh, for Julian Assange. You've been just fabulous. I know Roger always tunes in when you're on. So you got this magnetism about you and this genuine uh, nature. Uh, and uh, you're a man of incredible principles. And uh, you really have galvanized when you dropped in like a comet two years ago. You galvanized a lot of us. And thank you for your work. Gabriel, of course, uh, you know, uh, you know, thank you for, and not thank you, but uh, I know what, I think I know what you're going through to have my brother in jail like that, or my mother or my sister uh, would, would just be devastating. Chuck, keep on uh, trucking. And uh, Roger, we're going to go out. Speaking of Nils, we played your music earlier. So we're going to go out with your version. I think it's a fast version of Moonlight Sonata with some wonderful pictures that, uh, that Kelly put together. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you. And you guys can watch this. And uh, that'll be it. We'll see you tomorrow, folks, at exactly noon. I'll be there a few minutes early. I know Chuck will uh, with banners and stuff uh, on 47th and 2nd Avenue. 888 Second Avenue. You can't miss it. It's right here, the British Embassy. Please get out there. Tell your friends to get out there. If you're in the UK and you have friends in New York, tell them to get out there. We need a big turnout tomorrow. It is really vital. I know with Roger and with Gabriel there, it will inspire a lot to go out. We're going to go out now. Thank you very much, Kelly, uh, for another great uh, uh, engineering gig. And uh, we're going out right now with Moonlight Sonata. I love you, Bianca. Thank you very much, Nils. Thank you all. Uh, I know you stuck your neck out. Uh, Kelly just said.